everyone. Welcome to BookTrib Live, a Miramax Media production. Today we are thrilled to bring you the 2014 NEA Fellowship recipient, Rebecca Mackay, about her latest release, Music for Wartime, which is a collection of short stories. Rebecca's short fiction has been chosen for the best American short stories for four consecutive years, and her novel, The Hundred Year House, which is one of our giveaways today, is the winner of the Chicago Writers Association's Novel of the Year Award. I also want to let viewers know about those giveaways. Um, if you go over to booktrib.com, we are giving away music for wartime and the paperback edition of The Hundred Year House. And now we bring you Rebecca. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. We're so happy to have you here. And um, we'll jump right in. Can you tell us more about music for wartime? So yeah, it's um, it's a story collection. Like you said, there are 17 short stories. Some of them are very, very short, and most most of them, though, are longer traditional length short stories. Um, and the setting ranges everywhere from um, backstage at a reality TV show to war zones to modern day New York and Chicago. Um, some of the stories are kind of surreal. There's a story about a woman who um, in the modern day, finds Johann Sebastian Bach living in her apartment and has an affair with him. Um, oh, okay. And yeah, <laughs> and um, there are stories that are much more realistic um, and traditional. And um, what unites them, though, they're they're linked in their theme um, or their themes, um, which is right there in the title, "Music for Wartime." Um, there are stories that. Um, most of the stories are about arts or artists in some way and answer or ask at least, if not answer the question of what it means to make art and to try to find beauty and make order um, in a chaotic, sometimes hostile world. Wow. Were these stories that you've been writing along the way and you've decided to compile them all or did you write them all yeah. specifically for this? Yeah, no, these are, these are stories that span um, the length of my entire career. Um, the oldest story in the collection, although it's been revised heavily since then, was written in 2002. Um, and the most recent were written about a year ago, a little more. So um, we, you know, I, I was looking for um, a way to really assemble a collection. I didn't want to just publish a pile of stories that I happen to have written. I feel that a collection needs to cohere in the same way that an album does. Like, remember when we listened to whole entire music albums and there was sort of some <laughs> cohesion there? Um, or a fashion show, you know, that there needs to be um, a story that they're telling all together that's greater than the sum of the parts. And um, so I wasn't really ready yet, even though I published a lot of short stories um, when my first two books, my novels came out, um, I wasn't ready to compile them all and um, I didn't really see a way for them to fit together. It was hard to find yeah. a way for a story about reality TV to go next to a story about World War II. Right. Um, and it wasn't until I found the thematic similarities between them and then filled in some of the gaps between those, those very different spaces that um, I started to see how it could be a collection. Very nice. Now, you, as you just mentioned, you've written novels and a large number of short stories. Do you kind of approach writing each kind differently? Is there, do you have a different style of writing, whether you're writing short or longhand? Um, not, you don't mean longhand, but like long. No, <laughs> like, like long. Like I'm not going to write anything longhand. Um, <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're completely, you know, in many ways, they're completely different forms. Um, okay. And um, I, I use this metaphor too often because I get, Ask this question a lot, but the the analogy that I use is that um, you know painting writing writing a short story is like painting a picture on the head of a pin, where the challenge is getting everything to fit. Um, and writing not writing a novel is more like painting a mural on a really huge wall, where the challenge is also one of scope. But it's a matter of if you are close enough to work on the thing, you are too close to see the whole. Um, okay. So you have to find ways to back up and get the lay of the land, because you can't sit there and see your full novel in one piece. Um, right. So they, they bring unique challenges. Um, I think, though, that in general, my short stories tend to be a little bit more experimental um, than my novels, which is not to scare anyone away from them. Sometimes experimental means like weird and unreadable. Um, 
I, my, when I'm experimental, um, I think it tends to be um, fun, you know, like, like someone having an affair with Bach. I can't see you anymore. <laughs> Hey, hey, hello? Shoot. Okay, it says that I'm on there the screen. There you are. Hey, yay! <laughs> I think you're back. Are you back? Sorry, yay, everyone. Yes, A little technical yes. difficulty. <laughs> sorry. Don't know what happened. All right. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about that. Okay, where do you remember where you were? I think I was saying, I don't know what people heard. I think I was saying that um, I tend to be a little more experimental with my short stories and in a fun way. I'm having fun with them. Um, sometimes yeah. experimental, people hear that word and they think it means it's going to be like impossible to understand. I don't mean that. Um, I mean, it can be a little more surreal or tricky or playing with the structure, but in a fun way. Okay. What is it, is that what you love the most about writing your short stories or is there another element that that you truly enjoy about short story writing? I like that. I like being able to experiment a little more, but also um, I think that I like being able to have a variety of subjects. You know, when you when you write a novel, it's it's wonderful that you can live in that world for four or five years, just in the same way that it's wonderful to read a novel and live in that world. But um, I, I have a lot of ideas and I like to be able to stretch out and and, you know, Maybe there's a world I don't want to completely commit to and, and do all that research and live with it for five years, but I would love to work on it for a month or two. Um, and and I, I love that part of it. That's so exciting. I love that. Um, are there worlds right now that you're thinking about that you'd really like to get into as far as writing? Yeah, I mean, it's not so much certain worlds. It's like, I mean, the, my I, don't, I probably will never write this, but um, like I was in Washington, D.C. on Friday. And we're driving down the street and there's this construction in the middle of the street and my taxi driver says they've been working on the street for two years and i don't understand what's going on and because it's dc in my mind i'm like well maybe it's like actually fake like maybe it's it's like secret service and they're like being paid to just pretend to dig a hole in the street and like fill it oh. up and then and then i'm thinking like what would it be like to be one of those guys standing there if you're basically being paid to pretend to do construction work for two years and so right. like could I write a story about that that's not something I want to write a novel about <laughs> um I don't want to write a novel about pretend like fake construction workers but I would love <laughs> to write like a five-page story about it you know okay that's exciting know, <laughs> <laughs> well but it went in now, the notebook I might okay all right um, so many authors say that they have certain places where they do their best writing or the ideas come to them the easiest. Do you have a place like that where you go to when you write? Um, anywhere out of my house is the most essential thing I have young kids. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I love going to artist colonies. Um, those are places where you can go for, actually my second novel, The Hundred Year House, is set partly at an artist colony. Not just written there, but like that's what the book is about. Um, okay. There, you know, places where artists, writers, musicians, choreographers can go for a few weeks or a few months and produce work. And there's something so inspiring about those places beyond the camaraderie and the time. Like I was working at Yaddo, which is a colony in upstate New York, and I was sitting at the desk where Sylvia Plath wrote her first volume of poetry. And, okay. and it's so, first of all, it's really inspiring. Secondly, it's really hard to jerk around on Facebook if you're sitting at Sylvia right. Plath's desk. <laughs> So got lots of time. Um, other than that, I just got to the coffee shop or the library. Okay, fantastic. Um, 
as you said, you have little kids at home. How do you find the time to kind of maybe organize or make sure that you spread out your time the best to do it all? You teach, you have a family, you do all of this writing. How, what's your kind of go-to for managing it? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's my career, so it's easy to prioritize. It's not like um, fitting in something that's a hobby. Um, although right. I think for almost everyone when they start off, um, it is the thing they have to squeeze in on the side after the day job. And so it was harder back then because to say like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to Starbucks for two hours and work and, right. you know, ask my husband, can you watch the baby? Um, if I wasn't making money off of it yet, he was fine okay. with it, but I just felt guilty about it. Um, right. now it's just a matter of carving out the time and prioritizing. And my biggest challenge is that there's so many things that are urgent, but less important. Um, you know, that someone wants a blog post or someone, you know, I need to like the number of times that I've just had to spend like my author photo to someone in my bio because of some appearance I'm doing. And it's like, I feel like I've spent like, oh no, shoot. Oh, you're back. You're there. Can you see me? Oh, Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. You blinked yeah. out for a second. You, you ghosted oh, no. me. Oh no. Okay. Anyway, all I was like, um, I'm just keeping like you on your toes. <laughs> cool. Um, I've spent like hours of my life you know, at this point, like just sending my photo to people, which is such a stupid thing to do when you're not 12 years old. So um, it's it's kind of, you know, trying to get that done quickly and not procrastinate and just get it done. And so I, right. so I have time to write and big chunks of time to write. Now, we've read that you're a pretty big Mad Men fan, fan. Um, but it's over. So is there a new show that you're crazy about these days or is it always Mad Men? I'll tell you what I have weird feelings about. So I mentioned that one of the stories in Music for Wartime was, it's called The November Story and it's behind the scenes on this reality TV show. And I wrote it like maybe five years ago. It appeared in a literary magazine called Crazy Horse. And then I read it on This American Life, which is one of the highlights of my career. I thought it was great. Okay. Um, and we were actually in the process of considering, um, there was some interest in making it into a TV series. And I was very excited yeah. about that, although I wasn't quite sure I wanted to spend all my time on that, but I was excited. And meanwhile, um, Lifetime has produced a very, very similar series that's behind the scenes at a reality TV show mm -hmm. called Unreal. And yeah. it's only like six episodes in right now. And I, was, I watched it so that I could hate it and actually, I really love it. Uh -huh. So I'm totally addicted exactly. to this show that I really wanted to hate with all my heart. Um, and it's so good. And it's also like, you know, I can't, I mean, they didn't rip me off or anything. It's something that I think a lot right. of people wonder about, like what goes on on the other side. It's not like, yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, and theirs is about, mine was about um, the reality show that I made up was like one that was pitting all different kinds of artists against each other. And the one for okay. a lifetime is, um, like a bachelor kind of show yeah it's really exactly good. it is right. it is Absolutely. very good i'll give you that yes i have it's very good yes. um awesome. can you maybe spill with us a little bit tell us what you might be working on next is there anything yeah. you can talk about um yeah so i'm um i'm working on two things one is my next okay. novel um it, the the working title is the great believers but i don't know if that'll change um, and it's set um, partly in 1985 Chicago against the backdrop of the AIDS epidemic and partly mm -hmm. in modern day Paris, where um, one of the survivors of that time, a woman who lost most of her friends, um, has traveled to try to, um, to track down her estranged daughter. And she's also dealing with yeah. what happened in the 80s at that point. Um, I'm about half the way through a really rough draft when I'm excited about it. And then the other okay. thing I'm working on is... Um, Quite a few, there, were, there are four stories in Music for Wartime that are actually um, kind of blatantly autobiographical, very short ones based on my father's family and their very strange time that they had politically in 1930s Hungary. And there are a lot of unanswered questions I have about their lives. Um, there's a lot of historical record actually for both of them. My grandmother was a novelist. My grandfather was a member of parliament. And um, I really want to write a full non-fiction book. I, I don't want to use the word memoir because that implies memory and I don't remember any of this, okay. but sort of um, chronicling my investigations and my travels over there to figure out what actually happened. 
That sounds so interesting. I love that. Um, we are going to take to some viewer questions now. Jennifer um, would like to know, would you say that your latest book is your favorite? Why or why not? Yeah, um, I think it, I think it is. Um, I would, here's the thing, like, like a month ago, I would have said definitely, because like, you're sort of in this golden phase before it's really out in the world, where you can see it as this perfect shining object that nobody's ever going to find any fault with. And it's going to like, you know, be um, just sort of ascend into heaven magically and gold. Right. And, stuff. Um, and then it comes out into the world. And, you know, even if the reviews are really good, um, you know, of course, not literally every person in the world is going to like it. And it doesn't always go to places and do the things you want it to do. And it's not, that's not the issue. The issue is that as soon as it's real and it's out there and someone might dislike it, even though they don't, even if they don't, they will, but even if they don't, um, <laughs> it's just, it's a more, it's more of a real thing. And you start to use personally as the author starts to see its flaws. Um, right. So does that make sense? Um, yeah. I do, you know, I, I really do love it. Um, I don't think it's a perfect book, but um, I, I, do like it and I think that I'm it's really hard to compare it to my other novels I would say that I like okay. musical wartime better than The Borrower my first novel at this point it matches my current aesthetic more um and I think that some of the short stories in music for wartime are the very best things I've ever written maybe not every single okay. story I feel like I feel like a bad parent like like trying to <laughs> love one of my children more than the other or something <laughs> Um, do you think, Natalie would like to know, do you think that your stories have changed drastically since you started writing many years ago? Yes, um, definitely since I start. I mean, if, there's the question of like when I started publishing and then when I started writing. I mean, I started writing when I was four, so let's hope something, let's hope that matured <laughs> a little bit. Um, and I think Possibly back, changed a little. <laughs> uh, I look back on like the stories, the, the very serious short stories that I read in college and like, there was something there, but um, not really, you know, anything that I would ever put my name on now, right. you know. Um, but in terms of, I would say, like, since I started publishing, because I've been thinking about that a lot in putting together all of these stories for the one collection. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that it would be really hard to articulate how, except to say that I think I've gotten more comfortable with a few things that I was a little uncomfortable with at first. Um, I think I'm better at writing from a, man, a man's point of view when I when I want okay. to or need to. That didn't come easily to me at first. Um, I think it's there's not a lot of it in this book, but there's a lot in the next book and in some short stories I've published since then. I think I'm much better at writing about sex, actually, which was something I had okay. a hard time or, you know, as soon as I realized that things I wrote were going to get published, suddenly it was really hard to write about sex for a while. <laughs> and then I'm just over it. Um, <laughs> um, I think that, um, I think I am maybe a bit more experimental um, in a productive way. Some of my early stories maybe tried to be experimental and didn't quite succeed or were experimental just for the sake of experimentalism. Um, and now I think I'm able to use that maybe to a specific purpose. Wow, okay. Um, if someone came to you, this is also from Jennifer. If someone came to you and handed you a book and you started reading it, realizing that it was the book about your life, would you read it until the end? Ooh, wow. Hmm. Um, That's their question. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I would. I would. I totally would. Um, I'd like to say that I wouldn't, but here's how I know I would. Um, my, okay, so my, I, I was, I was raised in a very strange family, um, and I love them very much. My, my parents, in addition to both being linguistics professors, were also both astrologers, um, which oh, is an interesting oh, combination. Okay. And my mom, I, I'm not, it's like, I go back and forth. I don't want to believe this stuff, but then it's really accurate. And then I do, <laughs> and, um, I do have my mom do my chart. So, okay, you know, and I, and I kind of you know, some part of me at least really believes it. So if that's an indication of whether I like the spoilers on my own life, then I guess, yes, I do. Okay. 
Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I would like to know, what about writing quirks? Do you have any? Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, whether, I mean, literally like when I write, like I put my leg up like this, <laughs> I sit there, no, that's probably not what you mean. Um, but um, I think in terms of like writing, you know, um, I have, I, you know, I have certain words that I overuse constantly. Okay. I think everyone has words they overuse and I have to catch yeah. them. Um, one of my words, I have two words that I always, that are unusual. I think everyone overuses sort of qualifiers like just, and you have to go back and take them out. Um, but okay. um, I tend to specifically overuse um, the words strange or okay. odd. Okay. You know, when things are strange and odd, like, look, everybody, it's strange, it's odd. And then it's like, no, no, don't do that. And then, um, and then um, grinning. All my characters sit around grinning at each other all the time. Oh. And then I have to go back and edit out all the grinning. Um, Everyone has a And I don't have to be happy characters. <laughs> I just really <laughs> like to grin. It's a way to show that I didn't mean something terribly seriously sometimes. Like, this character isn't really angry, so I'm going to have him grin. Um, and then I have to go back and find a different way to convey that. I literally will do like a control F, like a find on grin. Right. And I'll be like, there are 35 instances in this novel. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what about the positive things that you get out of writing? Um, what do you feel? Um, come out of writing for you the best? And are there any negatives that happen when you write? Um, just the writing itself, I'm assuming, because publication is a whole different story um, and right. a different answer. Um, I think that, like, um, the positives to writing itself, I mean, I, I crack myself up when I'm writing. Like, I'm having a great time. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I think I get out of it some of the same things that I got out of playing with dolls when I was really little and making up stories with, you know, Playmobil people and stuff. It's just fun. Um, the negatives when I'm writing, um, hmm. I mean, I think if I'm, if I'm deeply, deeply into something, especially something new, um, it's not where I'm editing, but really where I'm composing something brand new, um, I can definitely be zoned out to the real world where like, I'm, you know, really hard to have a conversation with. I'm just completely in a fog. Um, that's a really good sign, I think, for me when that happens. The, okay. the times when that's happened the, the most strongly are the times when I've probably done some of my best writing. Um, oh, okay. But I kind of, you know, I feel like kind of snapping at anyone who talks to me, which is not how I normally am. So um, more that maybe that's more a negative for the people who have to live with me than for, for okay. people. <laughs> How do you find when you get into those fogs that you kind of snap out of that, or maybe you don't want to, a, and something does snap you out of it? That's the whole thing. I want to stay in this fog of whatever I'm writing, and then you know, ultimately, um, I finish writing it, or I get to the point where I'm revising, and it's not that initial phase of um, of stuff that, that came at the beginning. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Um, we have a question from Chase. So do you write your stories on your laptop or do you throw it back to the dinosaur times and write with a good old paper and pad? <laughs> this person follows me on, wait, what was, it was like Facebook. I said anyone who worked the word, the word dinosaur into a question at <laughs> this point. So that's really why he's asking that, I think. Bonus point, um, fun. Um, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, no, I <laughs> do write my stories on a laptop. I have a notebook. Okay. And I'll, do, um, I'll do a little bit of writing in there, but it tends to be sort of initial ideas, brainstorming, that kind of thing. Um, okay. Once, you know, and I like take, I'll like take notes on my phone, like the notes section of my phone. I'll sit there and I'll type stuff in. Um, but <laughs> um, the, uh, um, I do, you know, I, I know a you writers who literally write out entire books longhand, and I'm impressed by that. But I don't think um, I think too. It's not to say that these are good thoughts. I just think too fast. I, I would lo I would lose right. the thought I had if I was trying to write it. So nice season. Okay. <laughs> um, are there things that you feel? And this question is from Eliza. That you can do when writing a short story that you can't when writing a long by four. Yeah. Um. Can you hear me? Okay. 
I can. I can. Okay, because you just came through sounding really buzzy, but I could totally understand you and it's all good. Um, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now you're fine. Um, yeah, there, there are definitely things that you can that you can get away with in short fiction. I mean, I have um, I have one story in Music for Wartime. This is one of the kind of family-based stories. It's called Suspension, where um, it starts with this idea of this one photograph um, of when I was six, which is not a real photograph, but the rest of the story is real. Um, and then we're going backwards and forwards in time from that photo, where every paragraph starts with, you know, five years later, this would happen, or 20 years before the photograph, this happened. Um, and it's it's this very elaborate chronological mix-up, and it's, um, you know, it's you got to kind of almost do some math while you're reading it, which is not to make it sound scary. You don't really have to, but... Right. Um, that would be completely unsustainable, I think, for a novel. If you would do that for a novel length book, it would be sort of a gimmicky novel. Um, and maybe it's a gimmick for a short story too, but it feels like one that is justified by what comes out of it for something that length. And I don't think it would be for a novel. Um, so um, there's that, there, you know, you can maintain kind of stranger situations. Like I can have this story about this woman having an affair with Bach in her apartment in 2001. Um, and there's not enough time or space in that short story to sit there and worry about like, well, what are the ramifications of this? And how real is this? And you'd have to address those in a novel eventually. You'd have to like introduce other composers or something or have her go right. to a psychiatrist. Um, <laughs> and in you know a 10 page short story, it can just be what it is. Um, so I think that's that's absolutely the case, um, which is why, you know, I think that I really advocate everyone who's a serious reader reading short stories, picking up anthologies like Best American Short Stories or the Henry Prize stories, um, because you're going to discover new voices in there, but you're also going to see things that um, that are sort of the avant-garde for that individual writer, um, as well as for the literary scene. Um, not everything is like that, but there, you're gonna, definitely going to find some things that, that you couldn't in a 300 page novel. Okay. Um, another question from Chase. What advice would you have for someone who has written a bunch of short stories but isn't sure what to do with them next? Okay. Um, I mean, the next thing um, would either be um, to try to get some feedback on them by finding peers in your city with a writing group or, you know, getting to um, one of the fabulous writers conferences around the country, like the Tin House um, Writers Workshop, Sewanee in Tennessee, Kenyon. Um, there's some great places where you could go meet other writers, find some mentors, and really get workshops. Um, if you are beyond that, um, or if you feel like they're ready to go, it, the, the next thing to do is to really start checking out the literary magazines where you would want to submit them. Um, no one or sometimes once in a while someone publishes a novel where they really haven't published anything before, but to publish a short story collection, you really need to have placed some of the short stories in journals. Um, and that does not mean the New Yorker, um, you're not gonna get in there without an agent. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know, you're probably not even gonna get there with an agent because you're up against something someone just found in like F. Scott Fitzgerald's desk drawer. Right. But, um, but um, there's some fabulous literary journals out there. A lot of them attached to universities, a lot of them independent. And um, there's a great database online called Duotrope, D-U-O-T-R-O-P-E. I feel like that's like I'm typing in the air, like that's going to help you. <laughs> but um, but um, my father used to like literally spell, he still does, like spell words out in the air when he said them. And apparently this is what Aww. I do instead. <laughs> anyway, um, Duotrope has a great um, catalog of journals, what kind of work they're looking for, what they accept, whether they pay. Um, that would be a really good source. And um and then you just send them out, you know, send them out, send out your story to, to 10 places maybe um, that accept simultaneous submissions like that. Most of them do. And then, you know, pour a stiff drink and write a new story <laughs> and, and try to and forget that they're out there until you hear <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for that. That's great advice. Um, and I think maybe we have time for one more question. Um, how active, Felicity would like to know, how active are you on social media? And do you chat with fans regularly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm better at Facebook than I am at Twitter. Um, okay. And so I have it set up so people can just follow me on Facebook. Um, and I have like this, I'm not good at my author page. I'm good at my personal page, which you can follow if I don't know okay. you. And if I know you, I can find you. And, um, and I'm, I'm 
decently on Twitter. I try. I try with the Twitter. I really try yeah. hard. Um, and so I'm around and I'm on Instagram, but it's mostly like, you know, the like pictures of my feet, kind of like stupid, <laughs> like, like as if I were 21 pictures on Instagram. But, um, but yeah, I, I kind of love it. Like I, um, I don't think anyone should, any writer should force themselves into that who isn't comfortable with it. But um, I, it keeps you from getting really, really bored and lonely when you're sitting there writing or just, you know, in a house with like right. two very young children <laughs> and then you just want to go and blind and say something right. kind of adult to somebody. Um, I, I love that this exists in my lifetime. I'm a very big fan of social media. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, I think we're, we're all set here for today. We just want to remind everyone that if you go to booktrib.com, we do have two giveaways for Rebecca Mackay. Um, we have her, the paperback of The Hundred Year House, and we also have her newest novel, Music for Wartime, as giveaways. So you can head on over to the website and enter to win. And uh, we want to thank you so much for your time, Rebecca. Today was fantastic. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a good one.